read something actually from uh, an essay in progress. I, I think by the time I reach the end of what I'm reading, you'll understand why I chose this, but I'm not gonna give it away. Um, it's really just the beginning of something that I don't know what it's gonna turn into. I started out writing this essay about a trip I took when I was 23, and it's kind of, just keeps going on and on. So, so maybe it'll be something really long someday. Um, it's called Places We've Never Been. The year after our mother dies, my brother dreams a dream so often, he gives it a name, the dream of the blue stick. In it, a hand appears out of a thick fog. The hand is holding a stick that's painted white with three blue stripes around it. That's the dream, he says, looking at me in that closed down way he does when he doesn't want to cry. Just the fog and the hand that appears out of nowhere. And it's holding this painted stick, he says. It scares the shit out of me. It makes me afraid to fall asleep. I have to drink so I can. You don't have to be afraid, I say, though a kind of terror quakes through me as the words leave my mouth. I can see that hand, the stick, the three blue stripes around the white so vividly. It's as if it's my dream, too. What do you think the dream is about, I ask. Mom, he blurts, and then he whispers, it's about what killed her. I ask him what he means by that, but he doesn't answer. We just sit together on his futon on the floor in the enclosed porch of my apartment in Minneapolis, where he's come to live with me because he has nowhere else to go. My husband Paul lives there too, but sometimes I feel like it's only me and my brother, not just in the house, but in the universe. We have an older sister, but she's so far away. We don't have a dad. My brother and I are like two people walking through the wilderness, holding either end of a piece of string. I put my hand near his on the bed, but I don't touch him. He's 20, and if I touch him, he'll take his hand away. My love for him is particular and never ending and ridiculous. The dynamic equal parts big sister, mother, and fucked over girlfriend. It was for him that I was not at our mother's side when she died. And since her death, he has lied to me and stood me up, broken promises, and failed to repay money I loaned him. Maybe it's just a dream about being sad, I say, though I know he's right. Being sad is not what the dream of the blue stick is about. The dream is about our mother. It's the answer to the question of why she died. I don't say that in the grant proposal. In the grant proposal, I say that our mother died of lung cancer at the age of 45 because she'd been exposed to radiation emitted by the atomic bombs that the United States government tested in the 50s and 60s in the American Southwest, where she lived as a child and teenager. I say she didn't smoke, or at least not that much. I say it wasn't radon. I say it was the United States military industrial complex that killed my mother, who was born literally with the nuclear age in August of 1945, the same month that the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I say my mother's life is a metaphor for our times. I say I'm going to write a novel about this, but in order to write the book, I need to travel to my mother's childhood home, home in El Paso, Texas, near the Fort Bliss Army Base, where her father was stationed in the 50s, to the White Sands Missile Range near Alamogordo, New Mexico, where the first atomic bomb was detonated in July 1945, and to the Nevada test site outside of Las Vegas, where more than 1,021 nuclear detonations between 1951 and the present time. It's 1992. I send off the grant proposal, along with the first short story I wrote. A few months later, a letter arrives from the Jerome Foundation saying that they have decided to give me $2,000 to do what I said I would do. I read the letter again and again, studying each sentence, thinking I've gotten it wrong. I haven't published a word. I'm 23 years old. I've never been west of Minnesota. I've never had $2,000 before. I work as a waitress and spend my time off reading books, writing short stories, sobbing over my mother, and researching U.S. atomic history. I like to read about people dying of lung cancer and leukemia because they were exposed to radiation as kids. It comforts me, 
it makes it 10% more okay that my mom is dead. If she died because the US military industrial complex killed her, there's a reason she died. If she didn't die for this reason, there is no reason she died, and her death is a bottomless pit of hell that will kill me. I map out my trip. I list the military sites and towns I intend to visit. I make appointments with people who work for peace and environmental organizations that advocate on behalf of communities that live what's called, called downwind. When the Jerome Foundation sends me my check several months later, I cash it and drive with my husband to the Grand Canyon and say goodbye to him there. He'll work in the park as a cook while I travel around for six weeks. This makes him unhappy, but it's important to me that I make the trip alone. I have a 1979 Chevy Love pickup truck with a futon in the back that I'll sleep in instead of motels. I drive out of the park at dawn and stop at McDonald's to pee. My wallet with the $2,000 inside is too big to fit in the pocket of my jeans, and I can't hold the wallet and pull my pants down at the same time, so I set it on the floor and forget to pick it up again. I realized this three hours later, when I'm 160 miles away in the town of Jerome, Arizona, and I have an eighth of a tank of gas in my truck. It's early March, 11 in the morning. I scour my truck for coins and run down the street in search of a payphone. When at last someone picks up at the Grand Canyon McDonald's, I ask if anyone has turned in a wallet with $2,000 inside. Yes, the woman says and together we laugh. She counts the money for me over the phone, it's all there. She tells me she'll keep it safe until I arrive, but I tell her I'm too far away and out of gas and I don't have a credit card and no one to call. We agree that she'll put the wallet in an envelope and mail it to me, general delivery in Jerome. Ah, youth. Tomorrow, <laughs> or maybe the next day, my wallet full of cash will arrive. I walk down the sidewalk where moments before I'd run into panic, hungry and elated, my boots clapping against the pavement. As I walk, I realize that the town has the same name of the grant I won, Jerome. It's tiny, population 400. The whole town is a historic district, charming and artfully built into a mountainside. The one bar in town is called the Saloon. The doorways of the shops are adorned with paintings of old-fashioned prostitutes wearing pantaloons and high laced of boots, and men in cowboy hats and chaps and holsters. I walk for an hour, looking at things, my long, honey-colored hair tied into two braids that hang down the sides of my head. I mean the hair to be ironic, but suddenly I become aware that I look innocent and young, the way I did when I was 11, and wore my hair that way, thinking myself a cowgirl or an Indian. I undo the braids as I walk, pulling the elastic bands from the ends and then pushing my fingers through my hair. I can feel it rising away from me, kinked and fuller, like a bouquet on my head. I go into a small cafe to use the restroom, then sit at a table with a careful expression on my face as if to convey that I plan to buy something but haven't decided what it is yet. I read the local paper that's scattered there. I read Dear Abby and my horoscope. Circumstances take a sudden, dramatic turn in your favor, it says. Accent versatility, humor, intellectual curiosity. Don't be afraid to ask dumb questions. <laughs> I watch people come and go. I watch an old woman enter the cafe. I think she's Grace Paley. I watch her some more, and then I read my horoscope again, and then I go up to her and say, are you Grace Paley? <laughs> yes, she says, and her eyes crinkle into a smile before her mouth does. I tell her I'm a writer, too. I tell her the U.S. military industrial complex killed my mother, and that I want a grant, and that I'm going to travel around, and then I'm going to write a novel, and then how about how I left the $2,000 on the floor of the McDonald's and that it's gonna be mailed to me, general delivery. <laughs> my goodness, Cheryl, she says, you're one of my granddaughters.